The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 6 Emergency! Emergency! glared the klaxons throughout Magrathea. Hostile ship has landed on planet. Armed intruders in Section 8A. Defence stations. Defence stations. The two mice sniffed irritably around the fragments of their glass transports, where they lay shattered on the floor. Damnation! muttered Frankie Mouse. All that fuss over two pounds of earthling brain! He scuttled round and about, his pink eyes flashing, his fine white coat bristling with static. The only thing we can do now, said Benji, crouching and stroking his whiskers in thought, is to try and fake a question. Invent one that will sound plausible. Oh, difficult, said Frankie. He thought. How about what's yellow and dangerous? Benji considered this for a moment. No, no good. Doesn't fit the answer. They sank into silence for a few seconds. All right, said Benji. What do you get if you multiply six by seven? No, no, too literal, too factual, said Frankie. Wouldn't sustain the punter's interest. Again, they thought. Then Frankie said, Here's a thought. How many roads must a man walk down? Ah, said Benji. Aha! Now, that does sound promising. He rolled the phrase around a little. Yes, he said. That's excellent. Sounds very significant without actually trying you down to meaning anything at all. How many roads must a man walk down? Forty-two. Excellent, excellent. That is Foxham. Frankie baby, we are made. They performed a scampering dance in their excitement. Near them, on the floor lay several rather ugly men who had been hit about the head with some heavy design awards. Half a mile away, four figures pounded up a corridor, looking for a way out. They emerged into a wide open plan computer bay. They glanced about wildly. Which way do you reckon, Zayford? said Ford. I had a wild guess. I'd uh, I'd say down here, said Zaphod, running off down to the right between a computer bank and the wall. As the others started after him, he was brought up short by a killer zap energy bolt that cracked through the air inches in front of him and fried a small section of adjacent wall. A voice on a loud hailer said, OK, Beeble Brax, hold it right there. We've got you covered. Cups, hissed Zaphod, and spun around in a crouch. You want to try a guess at all, Ford? Okay, this way, said Ford, and the four of them ran down a gangway between two computer banks. At the end of the gangway appeared a heavily armoured and space-suited figure, waving a vicious killer zap gun. We don't want to suit you, shoot you, Beeble Brox, shouted the figure. Suits me fine! shouted Zaphod back and dived down a wide gap between two data process units. The others swerved in behind him. There are two of them, said Trillian. We're cornered. They squeezed themselves down in an angle between a large computer bank and the wall. They held their breath and waited. Suddenly, the air exploded with energy bolts as both the cops opened fire on them simultaneously. Hey, they're shooting at us, said Arthur, crouching in a tight ball. I I thought they said they didn't want to do that. Yeah, I thought they said that, agreed Ford. Zaphod stuck up ahead for a dangerous moment. 
Hey, he said, I thought you said you didn't want to shoot us, and ducked down again. They waited. After a moment, a voice replied. It isn't easy being a cop. What did he say? whispered Ford in astonishment. He said, it isn't easy being a cop. Well, surely that's his problem, isn't it? I'd have thought so. Ford shouted out, Hey, listen, I, I think we've got enough problems of our own having you shooting at us, so if you could avoid laying your problems down on us as well, I think we'd find it all easier to cope. Another pause, and then the loud hailer again. Now, see here, guy, said the voice on the loud hailer. You're not dealing with any dumb two-bit trigger pumping morons with low hairlines, little piggy eyes and no conversation. We're a couple of intelligent, caring guys that you'd probably quite like if you met us socially. I don't go around gratuitously shooting people and then bragging about it afterwards in seedy Space Rangers bars like some cops I could mention. I go around shooting people gratuitously, and then I agonize it about it about it afterwards for hours to my girlfriend. And I write novels, chimed in the other cop. Though I haven't had any of them published yet, so I better warn you, I'm in a mean mood. Ford's eyes popped halfway out of their sockets. Who are these guys? he said. No, said Zaphod. I think I preferred it when they were shooting. So, are you going to come quietly? shouted one of the cops again. Or are you going to let us blast you out? Uh, which would you prefer? shouted Ford. A millisecond later, the air about them started to fry again as bolt after bolt of kilosap hurled itself into the computer bank in front of them. The fusillade continued for several seconds at unbearable intensity. When it stopped, there were a few seconds of near quietness as the echoes die away. Are you still there? called one of the cops. Yes, they called back in unison. Now listen to this, Beeblebrox, and you better listen good. Why? shouted back Zaphod. Because, shouted the cop, it's going to be very intelligent and quite interesting and humane. Now, either you all give yourselves up now and let us beat you up a bit, though not very much, of course, because we are firmly opposed to needless violence. Or we blow up this entire planet and possibly one or two others we noticed on our way out here. That's crazy, cried Trillian. You wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, we would, shouted the cop. Wouldn't we? He asked the other one. Oh, yes, we'd have to. No question, the other one called back. But why? demanded Trillian. Because there are some things you have to do. Eva, oh, sorry, <laughs> because... I've lost it. Where are you? Sorry. Because there are some things you have to do, even if you are an enlightened liberal cop who knows all about sensitivity and everything. I just don't believe these guys, muttered Ford, shaking his head. One cop shouted to the other, Shall we shoot them again for a bit? Yeah, why not? They let fly another electric barrage. The heat and noise were quite fantastic. Slowly, the computer bank was beginning to disintegrate. The front had almost all melted away, and thick rivulets of molten metal were winding their way back towards where they were all squatting. They huddled further back and waited for the end. But the end never came, at least not then. Quite suddenly, the barrage stopped, and the sudden silence afterwards was punctuated by a couple of strangled gurgles and thuds. The four stared at each other. They, they stopped, said Zaphod with a shrug. 
Why? Dunno. Do you want to go and ask them? No. They waited. Uh, hello, called Ford. No answer. That's odd. Perhaps it's a trap. They haven't the wit. What were those thuds? Dunno. They waited for a few more seconds. Right, said Ford. I'm going to have a look. He glanced around at the others. Is no one going to say, You can't possibly let me go instead? They all shook their heads. Oh well, he said, and stood up. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, after a second or so, nothing continued to happen. Ford peered through the thick smoke that was billowing out of the burning computer. Cautiously, he stepped out into the open. Still, nothing happened. Twenty yards away, he could dimly see through the smoke the space-suited figure of one of the cops. He was lying in a crumpled heap on the ground. Twenty yards in the other direction lay the second man. No one else was anywhere to be seen. This struck Ford as being extremely odd. Slowly, nervously, he walked towards the first one. The body lay reassuringly still as he approached it, and continued to lie reassuringly still as he reached it and put his foot down on the killer zap gun that still dangled from its limp fingers. He reached down and picked it up, meeting no resistance. The cop was quite clearly dead. A quick examination revealed him to be from Bagulon Kappa. He was a methane-breathing life form, dependent upon his spacesuit for survival in the thin oxygen atmosphere of Magrathea. The tiny life support system computer on his backpack appeared unexpectedly to have blown up. Ford poked around in it in considerable astonishment. These miniature suit computers usually had the full backup of the main computer on the ship, which, with which they were directly linked through the sub-ether. Such a system was fail-safe in all circumstances other than total feedback malfunction, which was unheard of. He hurried over to the other prone figure and discovered that exactly the same impossible thing had happened to him, presumably simultaneously. He called the others over to look. They came, shared his astonishment, but not his curiosity. Let's get shot of this hole, said Zaphod. If whatever I'm supposed to be looking for is here, I don't want it. He grabbed the second killer zap gun, blasted a perfectly harmless accounting computer, and rushed out into the corridor, followed by the others. He very nearly blasted hell out of an air car that stood waiting for them a few yards away. The air car was empty, but Arthur recognised it as belonging to Slarty Bartfast. It had a note from him, pinned to part of its sparse instrument panel. The note had an arrow drawn on it, pointing at one of the controls. It said, This is probably the best button to press. The air car rocketed them at speeds in excess of R-17 through the steel tunnels that led out onto the appalling surface of the planet which was now in the grip of yet another drear morning twilight. Ghastly grey light congealed on the land. R is a velocity measure defined as a reasonable speed of travel that is consistent with health, mental well-being, and not being more than, say, five minutes late. It is therefore clearly an almost infinitely variable figure 
according to the circumstances. Since the first two factors vary not only with speed taken as an absolute, but also with awareness of the third factor. Unless handled with tranquility, this equation can result in considerable stress, ulcers, and even death. R17 is not a fixed velocity, but it is clearly far too fast. The air car flung itself through the air at R17 and above, deposited him next to the heart of gold, which stood starkly on the frozen ground like a bleached bone, and then precipitately, hur- sorry, precipitately hurtled itse- hurled itself back in the direction whence they had come, presumably on important business of its own. Shivering, the four of them stood and looked at the ship. Beside it stood another one. It was the Blagulon Kappa police craft, a bulbous, shark-like affair, slate green in colour and smothered, smothered with black stenciled letters of varying degrees of size and unfriendliness. The letters informed anyone who cared to read them where the ship was from, what section of the police it was assigned to, and where the power feeds should be connected. It seemed somehow unnaturally dark and silent, even for a ship whose two-man crew was at that moment lying asphyxiated in a smoke-filled chamber several miles beneath the ground. It's one of those curious things that is impossible to explain or define, but one can sense when a ship is completely dead. Ford could sense it and found it most mysterious. A ship and two policemen seemed to have gone spontaneously dead. In his experience, the universe simply didn't work like that. The other three could sense it too, but they could sense the bitter cold even more and hurried back into the heart of gold, suffering from an acute attack of no curiosity at all. Ford stayed and went to examine the Blagulon ship. As he walked, he nearly tripped over an inert steel figure, laying face down in the cold dust. Marvin! he exclaimed. What are you doing? Don't feel you have to take any notice of me, please, came a muffled drone. But how are you, Metal Man? said Ford. Very depressed. What's up? I don't know, said Marvin. I've never been there. Why, said Ford, squatting down beneath him, beside him and shivering, are you lying face down in the dust? It's a very effective way of being wretched, said Marvin. Don't pretend you want to talk to me. I know you hate me. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Everybody does. It's part of the shape of the universe. I only have to talk to somebody and they begin to hate me. Even robots hate me. If you just ignore me, I expect I shall probably go away. He jacked himself up to his feet and stood resolutely facing the opposite direction. That ship hated me, he said dejectedly, indicating the police craft. That ship, said Ford in sudden excitement. What happened to it, do you know? It hated me because I talked to it. You talked to it, exclaimed Ford. What do you mean, you talked to it? Simple. I got very bored and depressed, so I went and plugged myself into its external computer feed. I talked to the computer at great length and explained my view of the universe to it, said Marvin. And what happened? pressed Ford. It committed suicide, said Marvin, and stalked off to the back to the heart of gold. That night, 
as the heart of gold was busy putting a few light years between itself and the horsehead nebula. Zaphod lounged under the small palm tree on the bridge, trying to bang his brains into shape with massive pangalactic gargle blasters. Ford and Trillian sat in a corner discussing life and matters arising from it, and Arthur took to his bed to flip through Ford's copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Since he was going to have to live in the place, he reasoned, he'd better start finding out something about it. He came across this entry. It said, The history of every major galactic civilization tends to pass through three distinct and recognizable phases those of survival, inquiry, and sophistication, otherwise known as the how, why, and where phases. For instance, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second, by the question, why do we eat? And the third, by the question, where shall we have lunch? He got no further before the ship's intercom buzzed into life. Hey, Earthman, you hungry, kid? said Zaphod's voice. Oh, well, well, yes, a, a little peckish, I suppose, said Arthur. OK, baby, hold tight, said Zaphod. We'll take in a quick bite at the restaurant at the end of the universe. I told you we were going to get to the end of the book quickly. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So. Given that it's only half past nine, should we uh, should we start the restaurant at the end of the universe? Does that sound like a good idea? Shall we? Should we do that? Shall we? I think we should. Unless you all want to bugger off to bed early. Quick. Quick messages. Should we start? Should we start it now? Should we? Should we? Should we start? Come on. Quickly, quickly. Should we, should we? Okay, you've all fallen asleep. I've done a really good job. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, we'll start. Fair enough. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, this is an example of it paying to read ahead. Um. <laughs> okay, so here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll crack on with the restaurant at the end of the universe. Uh, an introduction by um, by uh, Terry Jones, the foreword to the 42nd edition, which I'm reading from. And I'll, I'll read that out too. It's kind of nice to put that into some context. So... The foreword by Terry Jones to The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, 42nd Anniversary Edition. I woke up one Sunday morning with a hangover and remembered that I'd bought two tickets for a five-hour silent film. It was the first performance of Abel Gantz's Napoleon. My wife also had a hangover and said she couldn't face it. So I rang Mike Palin and he said he had a hangover and couldn't face it. So then I rang Douglas Adams, and he said that he had a hangover and couldn't face it. So I prepared to sit for five hours on my own, watching a film I wasn't sure I wanted to see. However, just as I was opening the front door to leave the house, the phone rang, and it was Douglas, who said, I've been thinking about it, and it seems such a terrible idea that I think I ought to do it. Douglas wasn't afraid of ideas, even if they seemed like bad ones. Indeed, he was totally obsessed with the idea of ideas. Nobody, I suspect, reads the Hitchhiker books for their plot. Not many, I would suppose, read them for their characters, apart from Marvin. So why is it that we love the books so much? 
After all, if a novel doesn't have great characters or a compelling plot, why bother reading it? In The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, there is an interlude in which the ruler of the universe talks to his cat about how we know anything, how we know we know anything, or how we know what we perceive is what we are actually perceiving, or what is happening. And he concludes by saying, Perhaps I would like a glass of whiskey. Yes, that seems more likely. And he pours himself a glass of whiskey. It's one of those magical moments when Douglas's fascination with ideas comes to the fore, and it's those magical moments that I love in Douglas's writing. He's the only novelist I know who can make ideas a page turner. And the restaurant at the end of the universe is full of ideas and humour. That's the other thing Douglas was so good at, making ideas not only interesting, but funny. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy opines that every civilization goes through three stages, survival, inquiry, and sophistication. The how, when, and where stages. The guide says the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second by the question, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where shall we have lunch? Then there is the wonderful concept of the A, B and C spaceships, in which all the people in management, accountancy, advertising and hairdressing are sent off in advance while the creative and productive people stay behind and somehow never make it into space, deliberately. When you look nowadays at the BBC, or the National Health Service, you get the feeling that we all must have been on the B arc. In fact, the restaurant is full of slightly prophetic elements. No kidding. The one that makes me shudder at the edge of today's economic disaster is the section where the settlers from the bee ark have made the leaf into legal tender, so money really does grow on trees. But now they realise that there's too much currency available, and so, to remedy the situation in fiscal terms, they decide to burn down all the forests. So, welcome to Douglas Adams' roller coaster of ideas. Oh, and we had a great day at Abel Gantz's Napoleon. It wasn't such a bad idea after all. Terry Jones. The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. 1. The Story So Far In the beginning, the universe was created. This had made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. Many races believe that it was created by some sort of god, though the Jetravarted people of Viltvodal VI believe that the entire universe was in fact sneezed out of the nose of a being called the Great Green Arkle Seizure. The Jatravartids, who live in perpetual fear of the time that they call the coming of the Great White Handkerchief, are small blue creatures with more than 50 arms each, who are therefore unique in being the only race in history to have invented the aerosol deodorant before the wheel. However, the Great Green Arkle Seizure Theory is not widely accepted outside Viltvogel 6, and so the universe, being the puzzling place that it is, uh, so, sorry, and, and so the universe, being the public, puzzling place it is, other explanations are constantly being sought. For instance, a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings once built themselves a gigantic supercomputer called Deep Thought to calculate once and for all the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. For seven and a half million years, Deep Thought computed and calculated, 
and in the end announced that the answer was, in fact, 42. And so another, even bigger computer had to be built to find out what the actual question was. And this computer, which was called the Earth, was so large that it was frequently mistaken for a planet, especially by the strange ape-like beings who roamed its surface, totally unaware that they were simply part of a gigantic computer program. And this is very odd, because without that fairly simple and obvious piece of knowledge, nothing that ever happened on the Earth could possibly make the slightest bit of sense. Sadly, however, just before the critical moment of readout, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished by the Vogons to make way, so they claimed, for a new hyperspace bypass. And so all hope of discovering a meaning for life was lost forever. Or so it would seem. Two of these strange ape-like creatures survived. Arthur Dent escaped the very last moment because an old friend of his, Ford Prefect, suddenly turned out to be from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, and not from Guildford, as he had hitherto claimed. And, more to the point, he knew how to hitch fly rides on flying saucers. Trisha Macmillan, or Trillian, had skipped the planet six months earlier with Zaphod Beeblebrox the then President of the Galaxy. Two survivors. They are all that remains of the greatest experiment ever conducted. To find the ultimate question and the ultimate answer of life, the universe, and everything. And less than a half a million miles from where their starship is drifting lazily through the inky blackness of space, a Vogon ship is moving slowly towards them. Like all Vogon ships, it looked as if it had been not so much designed as congealed. The unpleasant yellow lumps and edifices which protruded from it at unsightly angles would have disfigured the looks of most ships. But in this case, that was sadly impossible. Uglier things have been spotted in the skies, but not by reliable witnesses. In fact, to see anything much uglier than a Vogon ship, you would have to go inside it and look at a Vogon. If you are wise, however, this is precisely what you will avoid doing, because the average Vogon will not think twice before doing something so pointly hideous to you that you will wish you had never been born. Or, if you are a clearer minded thinker, that the Vogon had never been born. In fact, the average Vogon probably wouldn't even think once. They are simple minded, thick willed, slug brained creatures, and thinking it is not really something they are cut and thinking is not really something they are cut out for. Anatomical analysis of the Vogon reveals that its brain was originally a badly deformed, misplaced dyspeptic liver. The fairest sorry. <laughs> sorry. The fairest thing you can say. <laughs> God, I'm just thinking that would explain so much about uh, Donald Trump. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> right. The fairest thing you can say about them, then, is that they know what they like, and what they like generally involves hurting people, and wherever possible, getting very angry. One thing they don't like like, is leaving a job unfinished. Particularly this Vogon, and particularly, for various reasons, this job. This Vogon was Captain Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council, and he it was who had had the job of demolishing the so-called planet Earth. He heaved his monumentally vile body around in his ill-fitting slimy seat and stared at the monitor screen, on which the starship Heart of Gold was being systematically, systematically scanned. 
It mattered little to him that the heart of gold, with its infinite improbability drive, was the most beautiful and revolutionary ship ever built. Aesthetics and technology were closed books to him, and, had he had his way, burnt and buried books as well. It mattered even less to him that Zaphod Beeblebrox was aboard. Zaphod Beeblebrox was now the ex-president of the galaxy, and though every police force in the galaxy was currently pursuing both him and this ship he had stolen, the Vogon was not interested. He had other fish to fry. It has been said that Vogons are not above a little bribery and corruption in the same way that the sea is not above the clouds, and this was certainly true in his case. When he heard the words integrity or moral rectitude, he reached for his dictionary. And when he heard the chink of ready money in large quantities, he reached for the rule book and threw it away. In seeking so implacably the destruction of the earth and all all that therein lay, he was moving somewhat above and beyond the call of his professional duty. There was even some doubt as to whether the said bypass was actually going to be built. But the matter had been glossed over. He grunted a repellent grunt of satisfaction. Computer, he croaked. Get me my brain care specialist on the line. Within a few seconds, the face of Gag Halfront appeared on the screen, smiling the smile of a man who knew he was ten light years away from the Vogon face he was looking at. Mixed up somewhere in the smile was a glint of irony, too. Though the Vogon persistently referred to him as my private brain care specialist, there was not a lot of brain to take care of, and it was in fact Halfront who was employing the Vogon. He was paying him an awful lot of money to do some very dirty work. As one of the galaxy's most prominent and successful psychiatrists, he and a consortium of his colleagues were quite prepared to spend an awful lot of money when it seemed that the entire future of psychiatry might be at stake. Well, he said, hello, my captain of Vogon's Prostechnik. How are we feeling today? The Vogon captain told him that in the last few hours he had wiped out nearly half his crew in a disciplinary exercise. Halfront's smile didn't flicker for an instant. Well, he said, I think this is a perfectly normal behaviour for a Vogon, you know. The natural and healthy channeling of the aggressive instincts into acts of senseless violence. That, rumbled the Vogon, is what you always say. Well, again, said Hartrand, I think this is perfectly normal behaviour for a psychiatrist. Good, we are clearly both very well adjusted in our mental attitudes today. Now, tell me, what news of the mission? We've located the ship. Wonderful, said Halfrand. Wonderful. And the occupants? The Earthman is there. Excellent. And? The female from the same planet. They are the last. Good, good, beamed Halfrand. Who else? The man prefect. Yes. And Zaphod Beeblebrox. For an instant, Halfrant's smile flickered. Ah, yes, he said. I had been expecting this. It is most regrettable. A personal friend? inquired the Vogon, who had heard the expression somewhere once and decided to try it out. Ah, no, said Halfrant. In my profession, you know, we don't make personal friends. Ah, uh, grunted the Vogon. Professional detachment. No, said Halfrant cheerfully. We just don't have the knack. He paused. His mouth continued to smile, but his eyes frowned slightly. But, Mabel Rocks, you know, he's one of my most profitable clients. He has personality problems beyond the dreams of most analysts. He toyed with this thought a little, before reluctantly dismissing it. Still, he said. You're ready for your task. 
Yes. Good. Destroy the sheep immediately. What about Babelbrox? Well, said Halfrunt blithely, Zephod's just this guy, you know. He vanished from the screen. The Vogon captain pressed a communicator button which connected him with the remains of his crew. Attack, he said. At that precise moment, Zaphod Beeblebrox was in his cabin, swearing very loudly. Two hours ago, he had said that they would go for a quick bite to eat at the restaurant at the end of the universe, whereupon he had had a blazing row with the ship's computer and stormed off to his cabin, shouting that he would work out the improbability factors with a pencil. The Heart of Gold's improbability drive made it the most powerful and unpredictable ship in existence. There was nothing it couldn't do, provided you knew exactly how improbable it was that the thing you wanted to do would ever happen. He had stolen it when, as president, he was meant to be launching it. He didn't know exactly why he had stolen it, except that he liked it. He didn't know why he'd be, he had become president of the galaxy, except that it seemed to be a fun thing to be. He did know that there were better reasons than these, but they were buried in a dark, locked-off section of his two brains. He wished the dark, locked-off section of his two brains would go away, because they occasionally surfaced momentarily and put strange thoughts into the light, fun sections of his mind and tried to deflect him from whatever he saw as being the basic business of life, which was to have a wonderfully good time. At the moment, he was not having a wonderfully good time. He had run out of patience and pencils and was feeling very hungry. Starpox! he shouted. At that same precise moment, Ford Prefect was in mid air. This was not because of anything wrong with the ship's artificial gravity field, but because he was leaping down the stairwell which led to the ship's personal cabins. It was a very high jump to do in one bound, and he landed awkwardly, stumbled, recovered, raced down the corridor, sending a couple of miniature service robots flying, skidded round the corner, burst into Zaphod's door, and explained what was on his mind. Vogons, he said. A short while before this, Arthur Dent had set out from his cabin in search of a cup of tea. It was not a quest he embarked on with great deal a great deal of optimism, because he knew that the only source of hot drinks on the entire ship was a benighted piece of equipment produced by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. It was called a Nutrimatic Drinks Synthesizer, and he had encountered it before. It claimed to produce the widest possible range of drinks personally matched to the tastes and metabolism of whoever cared to use it. When put to the test, however, it invariably produced a plastic cup filled with a liquid which was almost, but not quite, entirely unlike tea. He attempt to reason with the thing. Tea, he said. Share and enjoy, the machine repeated and produced another one. Share and Enjoy is the company motto of the hugely successful Sirius Cybernetics Corporation Complaints Division, which now covers the major land masses of three medium-sized planets and is the only part of the corporation to have shown a consistent profit in recent years. The motto stands, or rather stood, in three-mile-high illuminated letters near the Complaints Department spaceport on Idras. Unfortunately, its weight was such that shortly after it was erected, the ground beneath the letters caved in, and they dro <laughs> Sorry, I just know what's coming. Sorry. <laughs> just remembered. <clears throat> Sorry. Unfortunately, its weight was such that shortly after it was erected, the ground beneath the letters caved in, and they dropped for nearly half their length through the offices of many talented young complaints executives, now deceased. The protruding upper halves of the letters now appear, in the local language, to read 
Go stick your head in a pig and are no longer illuminated except at times of special celebration. Arthur threw away a sixth cup of the liquid. Listen, you machine, he said. You claim you can synthesize any drink in existence. So why do you keep giving me the same undrinkable stuff? Nutrition and pleasurable sense data, burbled the machine. Share and enjoy. It tastes filthy. If you have enjoyed the experience of this drink, continued the machine, why not share it with your friends? Because, Arthur said tartly, I want to keep them. Will you try to comprehend what I'm telling you? That drink. That drink, said the machine sweetly, was individually tailored to meet your personal requirements for nutrition and pleasure. Ah said Arthur. So I'm a masochist on a diet, am I? Share and enjoy. Oh, shut up. Will that be all? Arthur decided to give up. Yes, he said. Then he decided he'd be damned if he'd give up. No, no, he said. Look, it's very, very simple. All I want is a cup of tea. You are going to make one for me. Keep quiet and listen. And he sat. He told the Nutrimatic about India. He told it about China. He told it about Ceylon. He told it about broad leaves drying in the sun. He told it about silver teapots. He told it about summer afternoons on the lawn. He told it about putting in the milk before the tea so it wouldn't get scalded. He told it, briefly, about the history of the East India Company. So that's it, is it? said the Nutrimatic when he'd finished. Yes, said Arthur. That is what I want. You want the taste of dried leaves boiled in water? Uh, yes, with milk. Squirt it out of a cow. Well, in a manner of speaking, I suppose. Hmm, I'm going to need some help with this one, said the machine, somewhat tersely. All the cheerful burbling had dropped out of its voice, and now it meant business. Well, anything I can do, said Arthur. You've done quite enough, the Nutrimatic informed him. It summoned up the ship's computer. Hi there, said the ship's computer. The Nutrimatic explained to the, about tea to the ship's computer. The computer boggled, linked logic circuits with the Nutrimatic, and together they lapsed into a grim silence. Arthur watched and waited for a while, but nothing further happened. He thumped it, but still nothing happened. Eventually, he gave up and wandered up to the bridge. In the empty wastes of space, the heart of gold hung still. Around it blazed the billion pinpricks of the galaxy. Towards it crept the ugly yellow lump of the Vogon ship. Does anyone have a kettle? Arthur asked as he walked onto the bridge, and instantly began to wonder why Trillian was yelling at the computer to talk to her. Ford was thumping it, and Zaford was kicking it, and also why there was a yellow nasty lump on the vision screen. He put down the empty cup he was carrying and walked over to them. Hello, he said. At that moment, Zaphod flung himself over to the polished marble surface that contained the instruments that controlled the conventional photon drive. They materialised beneath his hands and he flipped over to manual control. He pushed, he pulled, he pressed, and he swore. The photon drive gave a sickly judder and cut out again. Something up, said Arthur. Hey! Did you hear that? 
muttered Zaphod as he leapt now for the manual controls on the infinite improbability drive. The monkey spoke! The improbability drive gave two small whines and then also cut out. Pure history, man, said Zaphod, kicking the improbability drive. A talking monkey! If you're upset about something, said Arthur, Vogons snapped forward. We're under attack. Arthur gibbered. What, what are you doing? Let's get out of here. Can't. The computer's jammed. Jammed? It says all its circuits are occupied. There's no power anywhere in the ship. Ford moved away from the computer terminal, wiped a sleeve across his forehead, and slumped back against the wall. Nothing we can do, he said. He glared at nothing and bit his lip. When Arthur had been a boy at school, long before the earth had been demolished, he had used to play football. He'd not been any good at it, and his particular speciality had been scoring own goals in important matches. Whenever this happened, he used to experience a peculiar tingling around the back of his neck that would slowly creep up across his cheeks and heat his brow. The image of mud and grass and lots of little jeering boys flinging it at him suddenly came vividly to his mind at this very moment. A peculiar tingling sensation at the back of his neck was creeping up across his cheeks and heating his brow. He started to speak and stopped. He started to speak again and stopped again. Finally, he managed to speak. Um, <clears throat> he cleared his throat. Tell me, he continued, and said it so nervously that the others all turned round to stare at him. He glanced at the yellow approaching blob on the vision screen. Um, tell me, he said, again, did uh, the computer say uh, what was occupying it? I just ask out of interest. Their eyes were riveted on him. And, uh, well, that's it, really, just asking. Zaphod put out a hand and held Arthur by the scruff of the neck. "'What have you done to it, monkey man?' he breathed. "'Well,' said Arthur, "'nothing, in fact. It's, "'It's just that I think a short while ago "'it was trying to work out how to... "'Yes. "'Make me some tea.' That's right, guys, the computer sang out suddenly. Just coping with that problem right now, and wow, it's a biggie. Be with you in a while. It lapsed back into a silence that was only matched for sheer intensity by the silence of the three people staring at Arthur Dent. As if to relieve the tension, the Vogons chose that moment to start firing. Tea. Cold tea. Ugh, never mind. <coughs> Cold tea is better than no tea at all. The ship shook. The ship thundered. Outside, the inch-thick force shield around it blistered and crackled and spat under the barrage of a dozen thirty megahertz definite kill photo fo photrazon cannon. Let's try that again, shall we, kids? The barrage of a dozen thirty megahertz definite kill photrazon cannon, and it looked as if it wouldn't be around for long. Four minutes is how long Ford Prefect gave it. Three minutes and fifty seconds, he said a short while later. Forty-five seconds, he added at the appropriate time. He flicked idly at some useless switches, and then gave Arthur an unfriendly look. Dying for a cup of tea, eh? he said. 
Three minutes and forty seconds. Will you stop counting? snarled Zaphod. Yes, said Ford Prefect. In three minutes and thirty-five seconds. Aboard the Vogon ship, Prostechnik Vogon Jeltz was puzzled. He had expected a chase. He had expected an exciting grapple with tractor beams. He had expected to have to use the specially installed subcyclic normality assertitron to counter the Heart of Gold's infinite improbability drive. But the subcyclic normal normality assertitron lay idle as the Heart of Gold just sat there and took it. A dozen 30 megahertz definitely kill photoson cannon continued to blaze away at the Heart of Gold. And still, it just sat there and took it. He tested every sensor at his disposal to see if there was any subtle trickery afoot. But no subtle trickery was to be found. He didn't know about the tea, of course. Nor did he know exactly how the occupants of the Heart of Gold were spending the last three minutes and thirty seconds of life they had left to spend. Quite how Zaphod Beeblebrox arrived at the idea of holding a séance at this point is something he was never quite clear on. Obviously, the subject of death was in the air, but more as something to be avoided than harped upon. Possibly, the horror that Zaphod experienced at the prospect of being reunited with his deceased relatives led on to the thought that they might just feel the same way about him, and, what's more, be able to do something about helping to postpone this reunion. Or again, it might just have been uh, one of the strange promptings that occasionally surfaced from that dark area of his mind that he had inexplicably locked off prior to becoming president of the galaxy. You want to talk to your great-grandfather, boggled Ford. Yeah. Does it have to be now? The ship continued to shake and thunder. The temperature was rising, the light getting dimmer. All the energy the computer didn't require for thinking about T was being pumped into the rapidly fading force field. Yeah, insisted Zaphon. Listen, Ford, I think he may be able to help us. Are you sure you mean think? Pick your words with care. Suggest something else we can do. Uh, well... Okay, round the central console. Now, come on, Trillion, Monkey Man, move! They clustered round the central console in confusion, sat down and, feeling exceptionally foolish, held hands. With his third hand, Zaphod turned off the lights. Darkness grabbed the ship. Outside, the thunderous roar of the definite kill cannon continued to rip at the force field. Concentrate, hissed Zaphod, on his name. What is it? asked Arthur. Zaphod Beeblebrox the Fourth. What? Zaphod Beeblebrox the Fourth, concentrate. The Fourth? Yeah, listen, I'm Zaphod Beeblebrox. My father was Zaphod Beeblebrox the Second. My grandfather, Zaphod Beeblebrox the Third. What? There was an accident with a contraceptive and a time machine. Now, concentrate. Three minutes, said Ford Prefect. Why, said Arthur Dent, are we doing this? Shut up, suggested Zaphod Beeblebrox. Trillian said nothing. What, she thought, was there to say? The only light on the bridge came from two dim red triangles in a far corner, where Marvin the paranoid android sat slumped, ignoring all and ignored by all, in a private and rather unpleasant world of his own. Round the central console, four figures hunched in tight concentration, trying to blot from their minds the terrifying shuddering of the ship and the fearful roar that echoed through it. They concentrated. Still, 
they concentrated. And still they concentrated. The seconds ticked by. On Zaphod's brows stood beads of sweat, first of concentration, then of frustration, and finally of embarrassment. At last he let out a cry of anger, snatched back his hands from Trillian and Ford, and stabbed at the light switch. Ah! I was beginning to think you'd never turn the lights on, said a voice. Not too bright, please. My eyes aren't what they used to be. Four figures jolted upright in their seats. Slowly they turned their heads to look, though their scalps showed a distinct propensity to try and stay in exactly the same place. Now, who disturbs me at this time? said the small, bent, gaunt figure standing by the sprays of fern at the far end of the bridge. His two small, wispy-haired heads looked so ancient that it seemed they might hold dim memories of the birth of the galaxies themselves. One lolled in sleep, the other squinted sharply at them. If his eyes weren't what they once were, they must have been diamond cutters. Zaphod stuttered nervously for a moment. He gave the intricate little double nod, which is the traditional Beetlejuice and gesture of familiar respect. Oh, uh, hi, great granddad, he breathed. The little old figure moved closer towards them. He peered through the dim light. He thrust out a bony finger at his great grandson. Ah, he snapped. Zaphod Beeblebrox, the last of our great line, Zaphod Beeblebrox the nothingth. The first, the nothingth, spat the figure. Zaphod hated his voice. It always seemed to him to screech like fingernails across the blackboard of what he liked to think of his soul. He shifted awkwardly in his seat. Er, uh, yeah, uh, he muttered. Er, uh, look, I'm, I'm really sorry about the flowers. I, I meant to send them along, but, you know, the shop was fresh out of wreaths and you forgot snapped Zaphod Beeblebrox the fourth. Well, too busy. Never think of other people. The living are all the same. Two minutes, Zaphod, whispered Ford in an awed whisper. Zaphod fidgeted nervously. Yeah, but I, I did mean to send them, he said, and I'll write to my great-grandmother as well, just as soon as we get out of this. Your great-grandmother, mused the little gaunt figure to himself. Yeah, said Zaphod. Uh, how is she? Tell you what, I'll go and see her, but first we've just got to... Your late great-grandmother and I are very well, rasped Zaphod Beeblebrox the fourth. Ah, oh, but very disappointed in you, young Zaphod. Yeah, well... Zaphod felt strangely powerless to take charge of this conversation, and Ford's heavy breathing at his side told him that the seconds were ticking away fast. The noise and shaking had reached terrifying proportions. He saw Trillian and Arthur's faces white and unblinking in the gloom. Uh, Great-grandfather, we've been following your progress with considerable despondency. Yeah, look, just at the moment, you see, not to say contempt. Could you sort of uh, listen for a moment? I mean, what exactly are you doing with your life? I'm being attacked by a Vogon fleet, cried Zaphod. It was an exaggeration, but it was his only opportunity so far of getting to the basic point of the exercise. Doesn't surprise me in the least, said the little old figure with a shrug. Only it's, uh, it's happening right now, you see, insisted Zaphod feverishly. The spectral ancestor nodded, picked up the cup Arthur Dent had brought in, and looked at it with interest. Uh, great granddad. Did you know, interrupted the ghostly figure, fixing Zaphod with a stern look, that Beetlejuice 5 has now developed a very slight eccentricity in its orbit. Zaphod didn't, and found the information hard to concentrate on, what with all the noise and the imminence of death and so on. Uh, no, look, uh, he said. Me, spinning in my grave, barked the ancestor. 
He slammed the cup down and pointed a quivering, stick-like see-through finger at Zaphod. Your fault, he screeched. One minute thirty, muttered Ford, in his head in his hands. Yeah, look, great granddad, can you actually uh, help? Uh, because. Help! exclaimed the old man as if he'd been asked for a stoat. Yeah, help and uh, like her now, because otherwise. Help! repeated the old man as if he'd been asked for a lightly grilled stoat in a bun with french fries on the side. He stood amazed. You go swanning your way around the galaxy with your... The ancestor waved a contemptuous hand. With your disreputable friends, too busy to put flowers on my grave, plastic ones would have done. Would have been quite appropriate from you too. But no, too busy, too modern, too sceptical, till you suddenly find yourself in a bit of a fix and come over suddenly all astrally minded. He shook his head carefully, so as not to disturb the slumber of the other one, which was already becoming somewhat restive. Well, I don't know, young Zaphod, he continued more calmly. I'll have to think about this one. One minute ten, said Ford hollowly. Zaphod Beeblebrox IV peered at him curiously. Why does that man keep talking in numbers? he said. Oh, yeah, those numbers, said Zaphod tersely, are the time we've got left to live. Oh, said his great-grandfather. He grunted to himself. Doesn't apply to me, of course, he said, and moved off to a dimmer recess of the bridge in search of something else to poke around at. Zaphod felt he was teetering on the edge of madness and wondered if he shouldn't just jump over and have done with it. Great grandfather, he said, it applies to us. We are still alive and we are about to lose our lives. Good job, too. What? What use is your life to anyone? When I think of what you made of it, the phrase pig's ear comes irresistibly to mind. But I was president of the galaxy, man. Huh, muttered his ancestor. And what kind of a job is that for a Beeblebrox? Hey, what? Only president, you know, of the whole galaxy. Conceited little mega puppy. Zaphod blinked in bewilderment. Hey, er, where? What are you at, man? I, I mean, great grandfather. He, the hunched up little figure stalked up to his great grandson and tapped him sternly on the knee. This had the effect of reminding Zaphod that he was talking to a ghost, because he didn't actually feel a thing. You know, and I know, what being president means, young Zaphod. You know because you've been it, and I know because I'm dead, and it gives one such a wonderfully uncluttered perspective. We have a saying up here. Life is wasted on the living. Yeah, said Zaphod bitterly. Very good, very deep. Right now I need aphorisms like I need holes in my heads. Fifty seconds, grunted Ford Prefect. Where was I? said Zaphod Beeblebrox the fourth. Pontificating, said Zaphod Beeblebrox. Oh, yes. Can this guy, muttered Ford quietly to Zaphod, actually, in fact, help us? Nobody else can, whispered Zaphod. Ford nodded despondently. Zaphod, the ghost was saying, you became president of the galaxy for a reason. Have you forgotten? Could we go into this later? Have you forgotten? insisted the ghost. Yeah, of course I forgot. I had to forget. They screen your brain when you get the job, you know. If they found my head full of tricksy ideas, I'd have been right, right, right out on the streets again with nothing but a fat pension, secretarial staff, a fleet of ships, and a couple of slit throats. Ah, said and uh, nodded the ghost in satisfaction. Then you do remember. He paused for a moment. 
Good, he said, and the noise stopped. Forty-eight seconds, said Ford. He looked again at his watch and tapped it. He looked up. Hey, the noise has stopped, he said. A mischievous twinkle gleamed in the ghost's hard little eyes. I've slowed time down for a moment, he said. Just for a moment, you understand. I would hate you to miss... I would hate you to miss all I have to say. Now, listen to me, you see-through old bat, said Zaphod, leaping out of his chair. A... Thanks for stopping time and all that. Great, terrific, wonderful, but B, no thanks for the homily thanks, right? I mean, I don't know what this great thing I'm meant to be doing is, and it looks to me as if I was supposed not to know, and I resent that, right? The old knew me, the old me knew, the old me cared. Fine, so far so hoopy. Except that the old me cared so much that he actually got inside his own brain, my own brain, and locked it off the bits that knew and cared. Because if I knew and cared, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to go and be president. And I wouldn't be able to steal the ship, which must be the important thing. But this former self of mine killed himself off, didn't he? By changing my brain. Okay, that was his choice. This new me has his own choices to make, and by a strange coincidence, those choices involve not knowing and not caring about this big number, whatever it is. That's what he wanted, and that's what he got. Except this old self of mine tried to leave himself in control, leaving orders for me in the bit of my brain he locked off. Well, I don't want to know, and I don't want to hear them. That's my choice. I am not going to be anybody's puppet, particularly not my own. Zaphod banged on the console in fury, oblivious of the dumbfounded looks he was attracting. The old me is dead, he raved, killed himself. The dead shouldn't hang around trying to interfere with the living. And yet you summon me up to help you out of a scrape, said the ghost. Ah, said Zaphod, sitting down again. Well, that's different, isn't it? He grinned at Trillian, weakly. Zaphod. "'rasped the apparition. "'I think the only reason I waste my breath on you "'is that being dead, I don't have any other use for it.' "'Okay,' said Zaphod. "'Why didn't you tell me what the big secret is? "'Try me.' "'Zaphod, you knew when you were president of the galaxy, "'as did Uden Ranks before you, "'that the president is nothing, a cipher. "'Somewhere in the shadows behind is another man, "'being something.' with ultimate power. That man or being or something you must find. The man who controls this galaxy, and we suspect others. Possibly the entire universe. Why? Why? exclaimed an astonished ghost. Why? Why? Look around you, lad. Does it look as if it's in very good hands? It's all right. The old ghost glowered at him. I will not argue with you. You will simply take the ship, this improbability drive, to wherever it is needed. You will do it. Don't think you can escape your purpose. The improbability field controls you. You are in its grip. What's this? He was standing tapping at one of the terminals of Eddie the shipboard computer. Zaphod told him. What's it doing? Is trying, said Zaphod, with wonderful restraint, to make tea. Good, said his great grandfather. I approve of that. Now, Zaphod, he said, turning and wagging a finger at him. I don't know if you are really capable of succeeding in your job. I think you will not be able to avoid it. However, I am too long dead and too tired to care as much as I did. The principal reason I am helping you now is that I couldn't bear the thought of you and your modern friends slouching about up here. Understand? Yeah, thanks a bundle. Oh, and Zaphod? Uh, yeah? If you ever find you need help again, you know, if you're in trouble, need a hand out of a tight corner? Yeah? Please don't hesitate 
to get lost. Within the space of one second, a bolt of light flashed from the wizened old ghost's hands to the computer. The ghost vanished, the bridge filled with billowing smoke, and the heart of gold leapt an unknown distance through the dimensions of both time and space. That seems like a smashing point to leave it. It's 20 past 10, um, and we've already cracked into the restaurant at the end of the universe. Hurrah! Hooray! 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 <clears throat> okay, I'm now beginning to sound like Kermit the Frog. Um, yeah, so that is, that is it for now. Um, I will not be reading tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to cancel that event. Um, but again, because as, as I say, it's a big, it's a big commitment for everybody to, to get involved with this so regularly. So I'm going to go at least to, uh, Sunday evenings. So the next one will be Sunday evening, Easter Sunday, um, uh, at, uh, eight o'clock. I'll, I'll put a little note into the bearded wit and, and share it again. If you guys can, um, share, liberally um make sure that lots and lots of people all your friends know about this let's get as many people as possible um for, for getting on with this but until sunday evening thank you very much um for another lovely evening everybody and uh look after yourselves don't be daft don't go out and screw things up um, particularly if you live in denmark if you're listening in denmark we have an opportunity to potentially start opening up the country a wee bit next week if we're very careful don't goof it up. Stay home, stay safe, have wonderful Easters. Speak to you on Sunday. Bye, guys. See ya.